Hey everybody, all the way from the Far East, I see Rachel is back. Rachel Ding, all the way back from the world were you? You were in China, you were in Cambodia, you were in New Zealand. While you were slaving away in school. Rachel was seeing you. You did. That's right. That's right. Don't feel, I'm not going to feel guilty. That's great. But I want to welcome her back and uh, welcome everybody here who's, uh, who's come in from town. It's great to see you guys here. Really, thank you for coming and uh, for making this CTP a special one. It's always a special one uh, to have uh, brothers and sisters come in from Montreal, from Ottawa, from Edmonton, from Calgary, really all across the board, and Boston now as well. USA. Places like, you know, and then you've got the, you know, just the Americans that are here that aren't American anymore. It's good to have you guys uh, here. This, uh, this CTP is really different. Um, in that we're going to try something different as those of you who are involved know and those of you who are maybe not involved because of work and you can't go but this is going to be a cool one this week because or in this next 10 days because half of it's going to be in Montreal and half of it's in Toronto and uh, you can, uh, if you're at church on Sunday and you're in CTP and you're uh, going to be going to Montreal halfway, halfway through the week next week uh, you can thank, um, well, the members of the church that you'll be worshiping with this Sunday who sacrifice and give that allow you to take the bus. You said, I thought I paid lots of money for the bus. You did, but you didn't pay enough. There's, uh, there are people <laughs> sacrificing to help you go and that bus to go take you to Montreal. It's pretty cool, and I'm sure you guys are going to have a really great time. I know as you slam, we'll make it, of course, really, really awesome. The first lesson at CTP. CTP, whether you're involved this week or not, whether... Yeah, I really like what Chris said. If you can't be part of CTP, you didn't sign up, you didn't pay the money because, well, you've got to work or you've got some things going on this week, you still got some exams, who still has some exams, or you still got stuff going on, that's okay. If you've got any free time and they're in town, make sure you join them. Don't, don't, don't sit at home and, you know, play FIFA. Don't, don't do that, right? <laughs> Come on out to the different classes that are happening through the week. Come out to the different activities. Tomorrow they're going to be, uh, we're going to be here in uh, downtown in the core, not just with everybody at CTP, but with also other disciples uh, in the Central Ministries of Toronto Church. They're going to be uh, uh, feeding some of the poor and the needy in the, in the downtown core. By the way, just take a look behind me here. Look out the window. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Look at that city. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. As far as man, for whatever man can do, man can do anything beautiful, that's it. Of course, God always does things way more beautiful just naturally, but that's kind of pretty right there. So tomorrow down in the core, feeding uh, those who are in need, uh, any, meeting any needs that way, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty great thing to be part of. Then tomorrow afternoon, there's going to be Jam Quest. Really want all of you guys to be there. Part of that, uh, whether you're playing or whether you're cheering, that should be great. Um, and then Sunday morning, we really looking forward to have you guys and a lot of the uh, college and university students, the campus ministry, will be helping us out with our worship on Sunday. So we're looking forward to that. Big room. It'll be great. Uh, that's at the uh, Toronto Center for the Arts here in the core uh, as well. And not everybody will be here for that, but most of you will be as well. So someone like Thor, he worships at West Church and you know, a couple of you guys out there. So, you know, in different places, or you're, you're going to come in, you're going to... Oh, you have the evening service this week. That's right. Oh, wow. Okay, so we'll see you. We'll see you in the morning. We'll see you in the morning. That's great. Um, so, listen, this is the very first lesson uh, of, for at least for those of you... So, here's my, here's my thing. Here's my challenge. I want to do a lesson tonight that you're going to remember, because... The thing that irritates me the most is just wasting my time and saying something that doesn't really matter to anybody and you're going to forget and not really be important. So anytime we open up God's Word, I want it to be a life-changing event, which is, I think, what you would expect of me, what I expect of me, certainly what I know God uh, would expect of all of us. That being said, if you're involved in, involved in CTP, you're going to have a lesson tonight. You're going to have, well, not a lesson tomorrow, but there'll be a lesson Sunday morning uh, at church. And then there's going to be a lesson Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then a Sunday morning lesson in Montreal next week. I'm telling you, if you're involved in CTP, you're not going to remember what tonight's lesson is about. 
But there's this invisible spiritual principle of God, even though you won't be able to remember exactly what we said in this room, of course you can write down notes, and I encourage you to write down notes, or if you don't have a booklet because Chris didn't give you a booklet, but you've got your phone or something, jot down some notes on your phone, what we talk about tonight, and here's the great thing that we can do tonight, whether you remember everything word for word or not, which you won't, we can start off in our first lesson on a really great trajectory. You know what that word means? With a great angle. We can go get us ready, get us, you know, it's, we've been writing exams. Some of us have finished school. Some of us have finished school for the last time. Congratulations to you. Some of us have finished school for the first time, and you're going to finish many times again. Congratulations to you. Some of you have finished school, and you don't know if you're really finished, or you need to take some summer school again. Congratulations to you. Wherever you're at... What we want to do here is, okay, we've got through school, let's start CTP, and let's start our summer doing well for God. So this very first lesson is, let's get us angled, let's get us banking, let's get us heading in the right direction. And so, the CTP this week, uh, and tonight's Devo, is called Lifeline, which is cool. The brothers came up with this, I think Chris did, just land, maybe Dennis Thor, the other guys uh, had a... Maybe they, I don't know what they did. They had a cage match. They had all these names. And they decided this is the one we're going to go with. And ultimately, I think this is the title, and this is the subtitle, The Way of the Heart. And my lesson tonight is, let me see if I got it right. Chris, do you know what my lesson is tonight? The anatomy? The anatomy of the heart. Anatomy of the heart. So just... <laughs> That's good for me to know because I might have to change on the fly. So we're going to talk a little bit about the heart, anatomy of the heart. And of course, we're going to talk about our spiritual heart, but before we do, we should probably talk a little bit about physical hearts. So, yeah, but what can I think? I should just come up with a little joke because some of you need to be woken up already. By the way, don't worry about the Raptors. They're going to win, right? Yes. Hey, money? Like it's mail it in. Like it's done. Yeah. So you don't even need to check. No. All right. Oh, there is that scripture. Though. Yeah. Right. Anyways, but we'll, I'll try to get done and we'll chat once in a while. Maybe we have uh, every intermittently through each point, maybe uh, somebody like, who's got data? Who's got data? You okay? You, you want to check for us once in a while? U of T Wi Fi. So just check for us once in a while. Just, you know what I mean? Just make sure. Have they started? Yeah. And what's the score? How are we doing? So Ernest, what is it? 3022. And you're not, are you going to name a team? Oh, for the round! Alright, so stop worrying. Because Jesus said, what about worry? Do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry. Well, he did say, do not worry. But you can't even change what? If you worry, you can't change what? Melissa. You can't change the future. You also can't change what? The past. <laughs> you can't change a hair on your head. On your head. By worrying. So don't worry about it. Raptors have got it. Okay. So let's start off with a little bit of joke. We're talking about the heart. Mm, okay. Uh, what can I come? Okay, here. Uh, so there's a lady. She had a parrot. You know a parrot, birds. <laughs> Melissa, you guys have a parrot, don't you? <laughs> I didn't like that. It lack of enthusiasm. You know a parrot. You know parrots. So the lady had a parrot, and the parrot wasn't doing well. And then one day the parrot fell over, and she picked the parrot up, and she went into the vet. You know what a vet is, the veterinarian, and she gave, put it. She gave it to the vet. She said, "My parrot, there's something wrong with my parrot. This is really, really terrible." And the vet looked at the parrot, and then put it down on the little table and said, "Ma'am, your the parrot is dead." Uh, he's, he's just dead. And she's like, well, how can you say that? You didn't even do anything. You didn't, all you did was, I mean, you didn't check. You didn't put your ear things and lips into his little heart. You did you, how can you say that to me? He says, why don't you do some tests or something? Why don't you take another look at it? He's like, well, okay, if you want. She's like, well, yes, I want. And so he goes out of the room, and she's in there with her parrot, not doing anything. And he comes in with a black dog. A black dog called a lab. A Labrador. You know the Labradors? Okay. And so he, he, he says, and he says, whisper something to the dog. And, and the dog goes up to the little table with the bird. And he starts sniffing around the bird. And he lifts up the bird's wing with his nose. And he checks out. And he goes over to the bird's little face. And he kind of licks his face and opens an eye by licking. And looks back. And then the dog looks at the vet. And then he looks at the, he looks at the vet again and looks back, and then the dog just looks at the vet and he shakes his head. 
And the vet says, okay, thanks, and, and he lets the, the dog out of the room. And, and the woman's thinking, well, what in the world is going on? And then the vet goes out of the room, and then the vet comes back in with a cat, this nice little cat. And he put the cat down on the table, and the cat looks at, at the parrot, and he walks around the parrot, and he looks under the wing and opens his little beak, and she's like, well, I don't understand what's... And the cat back and forth and inspects this whole bird, and then the cat looks at the vet and shakes its head. The vet picks up the cat and puts him out in the other room, and he came and said, okay, well, it's, it's official, ma'am. The, the parrot is dead. Uh, that'll be $300. And she said, $300? You didn't even do anything. He said, well, I did a lab test and a cat scan. <laughs> <laughs> Come on! That's pretty good for off the top of my head. That's what about the heart. Oh, the parrot died of a heart attack. That's what I forgot to say. That's how that goes. That's so depressing. <laughs> the anatomy of the heart. Come on, bro. Uh, this is going to be the kind of lesson that more than likely for those who are in Montreal, and it's great to have the few who are in Montreal, or the some that are in Montreal, I don't really know, but that's a strange feeling right here looking at people in <laughs> Montreal. But this will be a difficult lesson for them because I'm going to have you guys uh, help me a little bit with this lesson tonight. When it comes to, uh, let's talk about our physical hearts. Everybody's got one? Uh, if you don't, uh, you're not with us right now, are you? <laughs> so let me just talk, even though, humor me, let's talk about some basics of the human heart, physically speaking. I know you learned all this in grade 7 or grade 6, but talk to me a little bit about the heart, physically. How important is our heart? Okay, that was a dumb question. Let me get to uh, Tell me a little bit just about the heart. What are some... Hey, there's a good-looking lady. And, and her friend. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about important things about the physical heart. Just kind of anything, whether it takes you to biology class. It's like Nick. the source of life. Nick? Mm. <laughs> 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 Nick. Yeah, no. no, start again, because uh, nice and loud, though. Uh, Nick, you feel <laughs> pulled in? Yeah. It's a source of life. Uh, it's the body and pumps blood. Source of life, right? Pumps blood. <laughs> Oh, I like it. Say it again. Because that sounded smart. What is it? Yes, yes. Got your ventricles. You got nice. your stuff. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I mean, moving that blood around, it's importance of oxygenation and stuff like that. Keeping all your cells alive. It's amazing. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else? I, I mean, this, it's the kind of thing where you feel almost silly, like everything I say is going to be obvious. Rachel? Oh, I read this like, infographic that said that the heart can pump blood like 30 feet away. Can pump Ew. Provided <laughs> it, all the hoses weren't attached, right? That's a strong muscle. It's a very strong muscle. So strong, actually, what are the, is, you're really your strongest muscle, right? That's like, did you have one? Uh, one side takes the blood in body, the second takes it out. This is very good. Say that again. Right. So there's blood, of course, coming in and going out, and all the muscles and stuff like that, or the muscle. Like, your heartbeat, like, tells you whether you're alive or not, just like your pulse, the first thing people check. Yeah, yeah. Love dub, love dub. You know what love dub is? <laughs> That's your heartbeat, right? It's just not love dub, love dub, love dub, love dub. So, so listen, there's so much. And when, when we start talking about the anatomy of our spiritual heart, we'll get to some analogies in just a second, but some amazing things. Uh, uh, really about the heart. You know, if you're a hunter, if you're a person who uh, who hunts, which is kind of uh, politically incorrect, but but uh, there's an area on an animal, they, they, they've nicknamed it the boiler room. If you want to stop an animal's life, you have to hit it in the boiler room, and that's the area of the heart. And boiler room, why do they nickname it that? Well, if you're on a ship, and the ship has a boiler room, that's where all the power comes to drive the ship. If the boiler room goes out on a ship, you're now just adrift. You're no longer. And so there's all these different analogies that you can make for our physical heart. But here's what we know. 
without a heart. There's a lot of things you can go without. I can lose, don't want to, but I could lose this finger. There's a lot of me that I could actually lose, and I would be okay. I'd be a little unhappy. I'd be a little in pain. I'd be a little uncomfortable. I might even be walking in a strange way. But there is one thing that we cannot do without, right? Of course, is our heart. Now, another a spiritual analogy that just came to me while you guys are talking is, of course, you got the different ventricles, and you got these, it, like the heart is just a muscle, right? It's just an unbelievable muscle. It's the thing that started working actually before you were born, but certainly as you were born and you were on your own. And that might be true. You might be out of shape, but there's one muscle in your body that's not. There's one muscle in your body that's never stopped. There's one muscle in your body since the day that you began until the day that you, it just doesn't even quit. And that's amazing because when I think of other muscles in my body and I want to pick things up or I want to throw a ball, these are all decisions I make, but I, my heart is going and I have no effect, no impact on it. I have no decision in it going. Isn't that an amazing thing? Here's a cool spiritual analogy. You've got all the ventricles. You've got this, these two big chambers in our hearts and they're in the chamber of your heart is pushing blood out. And Rachel's gross enough to know that it can push it 30 feet if all, you know, if all my arteries and hoses aren't attached. But it's pushing blood out. Do you know what's really amazing? Talk about a spiritual analogy. Your heart is made to push blood out. And whenever it does, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, a really, uh, boy, um, let's say you had... Uh, a chamber that was soft and it was filled with liquid of some kind and, and, and a hose to a pool or something. If you squeezed all the water out of that, when it opens back up, all the water would come back in. God is so amazing though, in every one of your hearts right now, what's happening right now is there's a chamber that's pushing all the blood out to all the important areas of your body. And then there's two valves that always are there. They drop in place to make sure it doesn't come rushing back in. Isn't that weird? Anybody feel like passing out yet? <laughs> you know what's really cool? I just think about a really cool analogy that even your heart, like God says, even your heart is made to give out and not to take in. It's one of those spiritual principles. What does God say about you and your cup? That, that your cup should be what? You should pour your life. You are a cup and you, God pours into you to, to what state? Over... Flowing. Anybody with me? Don't be afraid to say it out loud if you know it. You're overflowing. That God wants you to give and not worry about getting back. Even that's the way your heart is made. Pushes out, valves drop in to make sure you don't have to take in. You'll be taken care of. That's kind of cool. Nothing to do, though, with my lesson. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Anybody fast on this? I want you to work for me. Montreal, if you have it, you can read it. Oh, we don't have speakers. Do we? <laughs> Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Can anybody read that for me? Nice and loud, though. If, you, uh, if you're not loud, you'll have to read it again. Ready? Um, Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else, guard your heart, so everything you do flows from it. Perfect. Wasn't that awesome? Can you read it again? Because there's a couple people not listening. Nice and loud. <laughs> Above everything else, guard your heart, for everything you do Above all else, so we're talking about the anatomy of the heart, we're starting CTP, we're getting off on the right foot, we hope the Raptors are going to win, let's talk about our hearts a little bit, let's talk about our hearts spiritually speaking. Some of you are here at, at Devo tonight, I'm not part of CTP, so is this lesson important for me? You need this lesson more than you need anything else today. Some of you are part of CTP, I'm not going to remember this lesson in 10 days, but you need this lesson more than anything else. How important is guarding your heart? Exegete it. What are the first words? Above. What's the second word? All. All. Else. Guard. Your. Heart. Why? What's the last part of it say? What's the last part of it? Does anybody remember? Still have the scripture? Everything you do flows from it. Your whole life has to do, of course, with your heart. Above all else, guard your heart. I just want to ask you a quick question. Would you say that above everything today, that was your biggest concern? Because that's God's scriptural instruction for you today. You were to guard your heart today, more important than you were to get to school, if you were still in school, more important than you were to return phone calls, more important than you were to show up at your job, you were to guard your heart today. More important than anything else. Why? 
Because everything you do has to do with your heart. And of course, we're talking about our heart, spiritually speaking. We're of course not talking about our physical heart, but we're talking about a spiritual heart. Can I say this? We're going to look at the anatomy of a Christ-like heart. Does that make sense? A heart like Jesus, because that's the best example of a heart, spiritually speaking, that I can think of. <clears throat> If you thought, if you told me, well, let's just do it. Let's play along. Jesus' heart, spiritually speaking. Give me some words to describe it. Spiritually speaking. Pure. Pure. Love it. Pure. That, sorry, I'm going to pause on the big of Ryan. Sunshine, I'm coming back to that. <laughs> but pure... Do you know there's not a person today in this room that had a totally pure heart day? Not one. Some of us think, no, I did. <laughs> and I would say, you probably did, until right now. <laughs> you did, you did, right? So, oh well. Can you imagine living as long as Jesus, let's say 30, 32 years, pure? Always, always righteous. Always godly. Always thinking the right thoughts. Never jealous once. Never gossiped once. Never impure. Didn't fool around with the girl improperly. Didn't lie to his mom. Didn't, not, nothing. Didn't cheat on a test. Unbelievable. Pure heart. Boy, I'm challenged already. Ryan, you got to get a sh share now. Salt. Salt. <laughs> so, what does that mean? What are you talking about? I don't know anymore. <laughs> yes, you do. No, this is very good. Ryan, I, I love this word because I think honestly, Ryan is one of the soft-hearted brothers, uh, spiritually speaking, in, in our ministry. But let me let me now see. What do you mean when you say soft? Uh, I think sensitive. Probably say. Sensitive, soft, sensitive. So thoughtful, caring. kind, caring. Love it. I love soft as well because when I think of the word, when I think about the fact that God wants you, you know, a description that God has for you. I don't know if you know this description. A description, excuse me, that God has for you guys is putty, clay, and He's a potter, and you are clay, or you are putty, or you are play doh. And he's in charge. And so his appeal is always stay soft, right? So I can do things with you. So keep your heart soft. Above all else, keep your heart pure. Above all else, keep your heart soft so I can keep moving you and shaping you. Beautiful. Other things. Jesus' heart. Passionate. Passionate. I like that. We love to be passionate people. Right now, there's a few thousand people in the cold standing right down there at what they're calling Jurassic Park. It's nothing like Jurassic Park. I've seen the movie. It's just a cement square. There's guys tonight down there who have taken an old basketball that they owned and grew up with, and they've cut out the basketball, and they're wearing it on their head like a helmet. And nobody thinks it's weird. People are just like, hey. Cool idea. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's called passion, right? It's a little bit weird, some passion. Painting our face. The raptors aren't even in Toronto. There's guys that have painted their face. I'm helping the team. The team's in Indiana. <laughs> You're not helping the team at all. I'm sorry. Passion, right? Okay, but that's... That's not even the same kind of thing. Jesus' heart was passionate just for what is right. Jesus' heart was passionate for God. It's a beautiful, great example. Someone else. Heart of Christ. Just humble. Say it. A humble heart. Humble. Humble. You know how hard it is for you to be humble? Yeah. Come on. Uh, actually, everybody should have. You know, there's about seven of you like, mm-hmm. Everybody should have went, uh-huh. Everybody. It's hard for you to be humble. You think you're better than you are. 
and you try to convince us that you're better than you are. And those of us who have, you know, self-esteem issues, we secretly say, I don't really think I'm better than anybody, but secretly, deep down inside, even self-esteem issues, they come from a place of arrogance. Even those of us who feel sorry for ourselves, self, you're self-protecting. It's a really bizarre thing. And here's Jesus, who is literally God. I, I just don't get all this, but you look at John chapter 1. When God was creating the world, you know, all that amazing thing, Genesis chapter 1, John chapter 1. Just John chapter 1 says Jesus was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. So you have God, Jesus is there. I mean, you see where I'm going with this? And then he comes, and he lives like you and me, and he lives around you and me and us and people, and people are... People are treating him badly. People are treating other people badly. And he remains humble. I don't even know how you do that. Most of you make it your goal to be a good moral person. And you come across people in your school and at your work who are not moral people. And you know what happens in your heart you have to work through? You have to work not being prideful towards them, don't you? It's easy to think, you're such an idiot. You're such a jerk. I am so much. I've been raised. I've got Jesus as my sin. And right there, you're not humble in heart, Christ was. Really, there's so many descriptions that we can give about the heart of Christ. You know, one that I like, I'd love you to read again. We'll get somebody else to read for me. Let's read in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. Here's a great word about the heart of Christ that I want to leave you with, even those of you who are worried about the Raptors right now. Luke <laughs> chapter 9, verse 51. Anybody got it? How about a guy this time? Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. It's kind of right in the middle of a paragraph. I don't want you to get caught up in the different parts of the paragraph. I just want you to hear verse 51. Anybody got it? Evan Ding, why don't you stand up, please? <laughs> now, Evan, you are the brother of Rachel. Yes? <laughs> and the brother of Ryan. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, with two amazing siblings like that, how do you stay humble, bro? <laughs> What's that? You don't. <laughs> okay. Oh, <no. laughs> it's worth the try, anyway. Hey, what are you going to read for us? Well, uh, just the one scripture. Sure. Okay. Any uh, chapter? Where? What book are you in? Nine, Luke, chapter 9, verse 51. Verse 51, perfect. Well, okay. It says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Resolute. I want to hear talk about this word resolute for a second. As, you talk, as we're talking about our hearts. What does resolute mean? Anyone? Resolute. If I am resolutely heading to Jerusalem, if I'm resolute about something... Post-secondary students, what does resolute mean? Like, you're sure? You're adamant about it. Sure. Adamant. adamant. Thor, was that you? Yeah. Thor, did you speak? <laughs> Everybody in Montreal, Thor just said something. <laughs> what did you say? It's a great word. Determined. Determined. That's what resolute means. Determined. <laughs> deciding. I'm going to, you know, absolutely... Uh, do something. Here is, as we launch CTP, here is a word, here is a type of heart that I want to challenge you to have. Not for the next 10 days, not for the next two months, not, not till uh, campus starts up next September, the rest of your life. To be a person who has a resolute heart for God. Amen. A resolute heart. Now, Help me think back, because Thor said it just about 30 seconds ago. What does resolute mean again? Determined. Determined. Jesus was set up, I am going to live for God, I'm going to Jerusalem. And people say, if you go to Jerusalem, bad things are going to I, I don't really care. I am going to live for God. I'm going to Jerusalem. And whatever happens there is going to happen, but that's the kind of heart that I have for God. My heart is not about my own personal comfort. My heart is not about my own safety. My heart is about glorifying God. And if God chooses for me not to have any comfort, if God chooses for me not to have any safety, that's entirely up to Him, but I'm resolute. Whatever God wants, that's what I will do. Listen, this is a great room, and I'm really excited about what's happening in this room beginning today. 
And I'm excited about, even if you're not involved in CTP, because you're frustrated, you wish you could be, but you can't, I'm excited about the, this opportunity that you have right now to decide, I'm going to have a resolute heart. Now, some of you are going, dude, done, I already did it. The night I got baptized, I had a resolute heart. <laughs> that's great. No, seriously, that's great. No turning back, no turning back. That's a song we sing a lot of times when? At baptisms. And you don't want to, you want to know why? Because at that moment, when you are the most resolute in your life, that song is a great reminder. There will be times where you're not as resolute anymore. When Jesus had the most amazing heart. I'm going to be a bit of a bummer if you want to edit this or unplug it or turn it off. I'm going to be a bit of a bummer, though. You know, something that is absolutely mystifying to me, baffling to me, but also I get it. I cannot tell you how many campus students I've seen over the last 25 years that have sworn and said and promised, I am resolute. I am here to the end. Nothing will take me away. It's God's way. My convenience is not important to me. I can't tell you how many. I'll tell you this. The majority eventually walk away from God. The majority. You're like, dude, way to bring down the room. Well, I think if we're big enough boys and big enough girls in here, let's be totally honest. Come on, bro. Let's be really, really honest. Stuff's going to come your way. And I don't wish for you, hey, i got a couple of daughters in this room. I don't wish for you a rough life. I don't wish for you heartbreak. I don't wish for you challenge. I don't wish for you emptiness. I don't wish for you loneliness. I don't wish for you depression. I don't wish for you job loss. I don't wish for you tears. And I don't wish for you anything like that. But here's what I can promise you. All that I just said are coming. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Some of you are going to find someone to love so deeply, so desperately, and they're going to wound you deeply and desperately too. Some of you are not going to find a person to love like that, and you'll be wounded in that way. Some of you are going to have children someday, and those children will hurt you in a way that you didn't think you could ever be hurt. Some of you won't be able to be hurt by children because you won't have any. Some of you will be turned on by your bosses. Some of you will lose jobs. Some of you will have the dream career. Some of you will never even get a shot at the dream career. Everything I paid all that money and went through school for, and I'm not even doing it. There's all kinds of reasons. Some of you, here's the big one, will be turned on or stabbed in the back or hurt by someone who's very close to you. Wait for it. Someone who's even a member of the church you go to. And, and these, these and a few others are the reasons we see people who at one moment said, I am resolute. I will never leave. Do you know 27 years ago, I met literally in this room. We used to meet in this room for <coughs> midweeks. Also, mainly on the third floor for midweeks. The whole church, all 30 of us, midweeks. It was amazing. And in those rooms, we'd have D groups afterwards. I can't tell you how many D groups I sat there and all the brothers there. We pledged, I'll be here till the day I die. I will be here till the day I die. I can name on just two hands the guys who are still here till the day I die. Hundreds. Hundreds. So listen, I'm going to call you out tonight as we talk about the heart of your heart. Not personally, not going to make you stand up or anything. I'm going to say, listen, if we're going to start CTP, you know what it's all about is really getting our heart in the right place. Jesus was resolute. Here's my challenge for you. Do you want to be resolute? I think I probably scared you. Maybe I don't want to be resolute. Here's, the, here's, the, here's some news that keeps me going. I can be resolute for God and crappy things are going to happen in my life and I'm going to hang in there. Or I can walk away from God. Guess what if I walk away from God? Guess what's still going to happen? Crappy things are still going to happen. That's just the way I, I look at it. 
Friends still kind of hurt you sometimes, but it's a lot better to have your friends hurt you and you got God than you're in the world and your friends hurt you. You lose your job or someone you doesn't work out, your love relationships, blah, blah, blah. You see where I'm going in many places. It's just better there. But it's so hard to have the heart that stays, to have the heart that endures. So I want you to start thinking now. What are some areas, I want you to start thinking, what are some areas that we must be resolute in? And I want you to share them with us. What are, like, just to think of one, what pops into your mind? We've got to be resolute, all of us. This is your chance to preach, but you don't get to preach, which is one thing that we've got to be resolute in. And before we do that, how are the Raptors doing? <laughs> What? 44-40. So we're still ahead. Great analogy for life, though. Sometimes you're way ahead. <laughs> and I'm resolute. I love the church. We're way ahead. Every day is just awesome. Right? Some days they come back on you. Some days they're ahead. Okay, I'm dying with this analogy. What are some things that we need to be resolute about? Anybody? Got to be resolute. Got to have conviction. To last till the end. Not the end of CTP, the end of life. Yeah. Melissa. <coughs> Reading our Bibles. Reading our Bibles. Don't you hate that answer, though? <laughs> Maybe turn turn off. People in Montreal are going to have no respect for her. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Don't you hate that answer? No, it's true. She's right. Read your Bible. How long have you been here and read your Bible? Nicole Lazine from Calgary. <laughs> Better known as Toronto, because she's really more from Toronto. She's from Calgary. Let's be honest. Nicole, how long have you been hearing you should read your Bible? Since you were born. You know, I'm willing to bet I know your parents before you were born. This is like Leah. Here's the great thing about CTP this year. We have the chance, the chance, the off chance for the first time ever in the history to have a baby born during CTP. Isn't that cool? <laughs> What would be really cool is we don't have to deliver Leah like as a group. Be, like, oh my gosh, the middle of jam quest, she's coming! Somebody feed the poor, we got a baby! How in the world did we get there? Because we were talking about Nicole, baby Nicole, right. So, all your life, you, all your life you've heard, read the Bible, all your life, my goodness. Thor, this is not a kingdom kid. Thor, how long have you heard, read your Bible? Since, Since you became a Christian. And it, let's be honest, I'm here's what I'm searching for. Is it, am I the only one in the room? I probably am. Because in the States, you guys are pure hearted, so that's awesome. And in <laughs> Quebec, right, pure hearted. Am I the only one in the room that when the evangelist or my discipleship partner, or if we don't like to call it, or my mentor, when my, my campus leader says, read your Bible. Am I the only one in the room that sometimes goes on the outside, Amen! On the inside, go, oh, again? Again? Are these guys even creative enough to come up with a different suggestion every week? That is cruel. That is cruel. I am picking on myself, but it is cruel. Am I the only one? No, we're, we don't think that sucks, do we? One of the biggest things, let me, let me share some stats about reading. Bible. This is actually a survey done this year uh, by an organization that's it's, it's written for a paper called the Journey, Journal of Psychology and Christianity. Listen to this. I want, you to, I want you to write some of these things down because there, I promise you, there's going to be days where life is not going well and you stop reading your Bible. And I want you to think of tonight. I want you to think of tonight. Oh, you'll have a bad attitude about it. No doubt about that. Have your bad attitude and think of tonight. And think of Oise. And think of, I was in Toronto. Nick, correct? First time you've ever been in the city of Toronto. Is that right? Yeah. Unbelievable. Ooh. Some of you are so ungrateful. You are born and raised in Toronto. This guy's never been to Toronto. Sorry, this is it. But anyways, <laughs> you're having this tough time in life. You're deciding, am I going to be a Christian? Your evangelist this week said, read your Bible. And you thought, when someone, uh, who, when anyone engages in reading the Bible four times a week or more. By the way, now what should you be shooting for? Yeah, make that a personal goal. About seven times a week would be good. 
Eight, eight sometimes a week, not on like a Monday, but you know, through the week. Keep feeding, keep feeding. But when someone who reads their Bible four times a week, here's some things that happen to them statistically. If you read your Bible every week or every day, or just four times a week, you are 228 percent, or you're 228 times more likely to share your faith with somebody. 228 times more to share your faith with somebody. You got friends out there who say, you got people out there who say, you know what, I don't even share my faith anymore. I can pretty well, almost, almost every single time when I meet somebody who's like that, my next question is, so you're, or my next statement that I know, so you're not really reading, are you? Oh no, I love God. And I'm reading His Word. I, no. 200 and, that's not even like, you're 50% more. 228 times more. Okay, that's amazing. I think so anyways. If you read your Bible weekly, four times or more, you're 231 times more likely to be discipled in your life. To get input in your life. <coughs> this is my job. I'm always getting with people. So, I'm sorry. So why did you make this decision? Sorry, you're now dating a non-Christian? Whoa, whoa, whoa. How? How did that happen? Oh, I love God. Whoa. You know where I know I can go right away? When did you stop reading your Bible? Because you're not getting any input in your life. Amazing. If you're doing, if you're reading your Bible four times or more, you're 60 60 times or 60% less likely to feel spiritually stagnant. You know as well as I do that when you feel spiritually stagnant, one of the first things you do is stop reading your Bible. You know it. Some of you are staring at me right now, or some of you are not even staring at me right now because you don't want to look at me. You feeling stagnant? It's because you're not reading your Bible. Isn't that amazing? <coughs> Here's a big one. If you're reading your Bible four times a week or more, you're 59% less likely to view pornography. Straight up. 30 times less likely to struggle with loneliness. 31% less likely to not, this is confusing, to forgive others. Does that make sense? Can you make sense of that? Even though I made it confusing? All right. You're 30 times, 31 times less likely to struggle with forgiving people. To struggle with it. You're just willing to forgive a lot faster when you're reading your Bible. Somebody hurts you, I can't forgive them. That's because I'm not reading God's Word. Here's a big one. Again, apologies to anyone who's not really in the room. Listen to this, though. If you're reading your Bible during the week, you're 416 times, did you just hear that? You're 416 <coughs> times, oh, i got to pause because this is that, that big. Good to see you guys. Welcome, welcome. Now look back at me. The Raptors are fine. Look back here. <laughs> if you're reading your Bible four times a week or more, you're 416 times more likely to give sacrificially to the church. 416 times more conviction than I should give. Nice. It's more than nice. You're like, yeah, dude, it's important to you because you get paid by the church. <laughs> yeah, not really. <laughs> not really. You know, when it comes to giving, I just want to talk to the campus students for a second. Brothers, sisters, we need to give. Yeah. We need to give. Those of you who are Christians, if you're not a Christian, okay, you, you work on that. I think you need to if you're a, not a Christian, but you come all the time. I think you need to, but I'll, I'll, let, I'll give you a pass. If you're a Christian, and I know the campus ministry, some of you guys, you're just not giving. That's a problem. And it's not a problem. Oh, that's a problem. You scare me, Kevin. You're calling me out. No, it's a problem with your heart. 
It's a problem with your heart, not a problem with me. You've not been giving for a long time. Church is just fine. You've not been giving for a long time. Church, the bus is still going to take you to Montreal. There's a lot of us who are reading the Bible and having deep convictions that we've got to give. But some of you go, well, it means nothing. It actually means everything. It means 20 years from now, you probably won't be a Christian. Really? Because I don't drop a loony in? Are you kidding me? Nope. Not kidding. It's that important. Okay, I'm seeing, starting to see how I bum you up. But this was Melissa's suggestion, not mine. Remember I said, what do we have to be resolute? And she said, read the Bible. I said, are you sure? And she said, yes. I said, okay, let's talk about reading the Bible. It's not my fault, right? Melissa's fault. Write that down. Melissa's fault. So that was... Point number one by Melissa, what we need to be resolute in, read our Bible. What else should we, would we be resolute in, for sure, determined? Ryan. Prayer. Prayer. Resolute in prayer. You know what the Bible says about praying? What Jesus' words are about praying? The Holy Spirit's words about praying? How should we pray? Does anyone know the scripture? Pray without seizing. <laughs> pray without stopping. Pray without ceasing. Always be prayerful. Just like Bible reading, one of the first things to go in a, in a, in a bad heart is prayer. As we get all bunged up about different stuff, we get upset about things, things aren't fair, I don't understand things, I'm feeling moody. Hey, if you're a moody person, I'm probably more moody than you are. If you're a, a potential to be depressed, I probably got you beat there. I, I have all kinds of problems. I'm a I'm messed up. I'm messed up like everybody. I'm messed up with the best of them. But you've got to make a decision. I'm this old. I'm sitting in this room on this Friday night at the start of CTP. And above everything else, I'm going to guard my heart. And one area I'm going to be resolute in is I will read God's word and I will pray. I will pray when I don't feel like it. I'll pray when I feel like it. I'll pray at the sunsets when the sun's going down. It's like, oh, God, I see you. Woo, awesome. And then I'll pray those mornings where it's like, oh, oh, God, oh. I'll pray then too. You pray all the time. Here's a news flash. God isn't as romantic as we are, right? He's always just like, I'm here. I'm here. I see you when you look your best, when you're dressed up and you just look fine. I see you. Pray to me then. I also see you when you get out of bed and your breath is stanky. I see it. There's, there's no surprises here, right? Pray all the time. All the time. Resolute in that. What else? Should be resolute in. Opening up, being open. I tell you what, that's something we work really well on in the campus ministry. Hey, let's be open, let's get discipling in our life. The older you get, you get a job. That's for those of you who are finishing school, you're about to launch out, you're going to get your job. I don't know what happens. Well, I'll tell you what, you go out into the deep swimming pool of the world, and you close up, and you get less and less open. And it all goes back to Ryan's words on what's beautiful about Jesus is his heart was, what did Ryan say? Soft. When you don't want to be open with your life, when you don't want to confess what's going on in your life, I mean, there's so many things that are off the rails. You don't want to confess what's going on in your life, you are not reading your Bible. Don't tell me you are. I mean, not really reading. You know, you may be like... Yes, God created on the seventh day. Yeah, okay, you may be reading, but you're not reading the Bible if you are not open and confessing. How often do you how often do you talk to somebody else about what's going on in your heart? How often do you? I hope I don't beat you in this. I'm an old guy. I'm an old guy that I don't even I don't even I barely make my phone work. I'm I, it's difficult for me to be in communication with other disciples. A little more difficult than you. I'm telling you, I, I'm probably, I, you know, I don't know. I shouldn't brag. That's, that's, that's redundant. That's, that's backwards, right? Let's brag about how open we are. But now you're prideful and you're arrogant. Okay. So anyways, I'm a very open person. I'm very, very open. With the guys that are
are discipling me, what's going on in my heart, what's going on in my life as far as my moods are concerned. Brothers know about my moods. My wife certainly does as well. Uh, uh, spiritually speaking, how I'm doing spiritually, what I'm doing, what I'm studying, how it's going as far as life is concerned. Everything. Put it out there. Where did I learn that? Your age? In this building? There wasn't CTP. Midweeks? Campus Devos? Learn to be open. You start it now. It's a good thing. Be resolute about that. So what are we going to be resolute about? We're going to read our Bible. We're going to pray. We're going to be open. Anything else? You guys have to fight. Go ahead, Joseph. Meeting with the body. Meeting with the body. That's such a strange... Like, I, I, my name's Kevin. This is my body. What are you talking about? Aren't I always meeting with my body? Never not meeting with my Everybody knows what that means, right? Church? Meeting with the church. Do you know that... Okay, don't have time, but let me just throw that this really basic teaching that you need to make sure you're teaching other people as well as have deep convictions on yourself. Do you know that the church is the meeting of the body? The church is the what of Christ? What's the bride of Christ? The church. But it's the body of Christ. Wait a second. No, no, no. He's with God in heaven, right hand throne. I've read all that. That's where Jesus is. Yes. But on earth, I want to know what Jesus thinks about things. Well, then, this is it. This is Christ's body. When we meet... I don't know if we've really got that deep conviction. You've got to. What if your church is boring? What if when all the Christians in your church come together, they're just boring? Nobody's supposed to say it, but they're boring. It's just not fun. I want to be a church that's fun. I want Hillsong. I want lights and fog machines. <laughs> yes, mosh pit worship. Oh, yeah. Well, when's that going to happen in my church? <laughs> Body of Christ. Where two or more are gathered. It doesn't have anything to do with entertainment value. And I'll tell you what. I think the next generation, your generation, the biggest reason people are going to be walking away with bad hearts is because of this. Mm. Not enough entertainment. Not enough entertainment. Don't use any bad words here. For, forget entertainment. It's got nothing to do with entertainment. If you come to church based on whether you're entertained or not, you're gone. Do you want to know why? Because the raptors can't even keep you entertained. They can. When they lose, it's like, I'm out. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. I'm done. Until next year. <laughs> Right? My church is boring. The campus is boring. Devos are boring. You know what that tells me? You're boring. You're boring. <laughs> I'm serious. Because you're selfish. You come, what do I get out of it? And if that's the way you're going to look at life, then you're not going to make it hard. Isn't that right, Carter? All right. You've got to be resolute in that. Anything else? Anybody else? Resolute? Serving, resolutely it's serving. Boy, this is amazing. Jesus came. <coughs> Anybody want to finish this scripture for me? To serve. He mumbled it. Dennis mumbled it. Or did you say it right loud? Did I hear you say it? Go yeah, ahead. to serve and not to be served. Jesus came to serve and not to be served. That sounds a little bit like the meetings of the body thing, right? He came to serve and not to be served. It's got the humility. It's got all kinds of stuff written all over it. Yeah. Be resolute about that. We're almost done, right? You can probably hit a couple more. Melissa. Marrying a Christian. We should be resolute on that? Yeah. Well, that's easy for you to say. You married a Christian. Yeah. I mean, like, sheesh, your life's probably almost over now. You got everything you wanted. You got your beautiful family, your beautiful boys. It's tough out there, Melissa. It really is. It really is. Ladies in this room, the number one thing that takes women away from Christ is this. Right here. Number one thing that I've seen, anyways. Men, the number one thing is usually more sexual related. 
frankly, just more primal sexual deviant sin in that way, pornography, stuff like that, and the guilt that's associated with it. But with women, this is it. I want to be loved. And then you start fudging on the scriptures, because you still want to be close to God, but you just want the guy, right? So you start fudging. Well, he's a believer. So the Bible says mm -hmm. that we need to be yoked with believers. So he's a believer. Has he ever been baptized? No, but he's a believer. Come on. You think that's called a resolute heart? I'll tell you what that's called, a mushy heart, a squishy heart, a flabby heart, a floppy heart, a no heart at all. But it's not a resolute heart. You know, you can make that decision. I'm going to marry a disciple of Jesus Christ. What if we run out? <laughs> What if God didn't want you to marry him? Oh, oh, God doesn't want me to hold on. God wants me to marry. I can tell you that because I feel it. Celibacy is not for me, mister. How do you know? I don't know where this is going. My wife right now is just horrified. You made an absolute resolute decision. I will marry a disciple of... Jesus Christ. Now, I will also say this to the ladies and the men in the room. Don't marry a guy. I'll say this to the ladies. I'm talking ladies in the room. Don't marry a guy because he has a baptism certificate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Marry a disciple. Mm -hmm. Well, he's in our church and he got baptized. Marry a disciple. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. High standards. Why? Because you're wrestler. Brothers too. High standards. Okay. I, I got to stop. We got to <laughs> Is, is, is the game over yet? Not yet, eh? Okay. <laughs> Almost. Almost. <coughs> Michaela Robbins. Sharing your faith. Evangelism. Matthew chapter 28. Yep. Verse 18 through 20. That's a great commission. You need to resolute on this. You know, the worst thing that could ever be said about you it's the most evangelistic time of your Christian life is when you were in the campus ministry. If that's ever said about you someday, that should be an embarrassment to you. Because you know what that means? You are only evangelistic because you had to be. You are only evangelistic. You only had the conviction to save others because people were watching you. There was no real conviction. The city of Toronto is lost, the city of Calvary is lost, or Edmonton, or Boston, or all points in between. But God, in his grace, just looks at us, man. Just have mercy on people. Why? Because Jesus didn't come to serve, but be served. It's all the same thing. You know, I guess, I'll just end. Let me end with this. This is a, right, first message. You don't have to remember it, but we're just... We're just going on a trajectory. My first message is a kick in the pants on commitment. That's all it's poof. Are you really committed? Over the next 10 days, if you're involved in CTP, you're going to learn things. You're going to do things. You're going to make new friends and laugh. You're going to go places. Some of you are going to stay in places you've never stayed. It's going to be a really cool experience. And you're going to get some deep teaching. Things theologically think you've never thought of before. You're going to share your faith and serve the poor and shoot a basket. You're going to do it all. It's going to be really great. But it all started off with this message about just the anatomy of your heart spiritually. How committed are you? And will you be here? Will you be here when I'm really old? Will they bring me in? They'll wheel me in for CTP. <laughs> yeah, CTP 2040. You know, and all of your kids are into university and they'll wheel me in and I'll be half in dementia and half here and I'll be like, you guys. <laughs> and I want to say the class, the CTP class of 2016, they're actually still here. They're the, they're the abnormality. They, everybody else, just some of them left over time, but not that group from 2016. They were here. Why? What was so special about them? They actually just made a decision. It wasn't the lesson. It wasn't the teaching. It wasn't even CTP. It was one night at Oise or on their walk home from Oise tonight where somebody or by their bed somewhere where you got down your knees and said, God, I just, I don't even know what this means. I don't even really know what I'm saying. I don't know where this is going to take me. I just want you to know this, God. 
That's it. I'm here. I'm here. I'm yours. I'm here. I'm talking if I'm crying. I'm here. I'm talking if I'm in tears. I'm here. I'm talking if, if my nose is running. I'm here. I'm talking if I'm laughing for the rest of my life. I'm here. I'm talking if I'm loaded and I've got money. I'm here. I'm talking if I'm broke. I'm here. I'm here. And wherever you want me to go around the world, I am here with you. You know, Jesus had some really rough words. Now, I, I kind of grew up a religious kid, but I was an unbelievable hypocrite, but a religious. I went to church a lot, but I was just a hypocrite. And when I got baptized, you know how a lot of you guys have really cool scriptures read at your baptism? Like, what are some of the scriptures read at your baptism? You guys want to share the cool things you have read at your baptism? Just encouraging stuff. Like, what did you read? Any, anybody? Philippians 4.13. Something about what? Philippians 4.13 kind of says, I can, I can do all things. Christ gives me strength. That's a great scripture to read in your baptism. <laughs> Anybody else? Thor, you remember what you had read at your baptism? You don't. Really. <laughs> hey, hey, Thor, you got baptized, right? <laughs> Rach, what did you have read? Um, first Samuel, she went OT. <laughs> what is that about? What is that about? Lord looks at the heart. What a great baptism treasure. Because there you are, in front of God and all these people you're baptizing. And you know what, folks? Lord looks at the heart. Drink that in. Mm, that's awesome stuff. Anybody else? Great baptism scripture? Yes. Joshua 1. These are Old Testament girls. These are good women. I like the Old Testament. What's Joshua 1 say? This is a great one. Be strong. And courageous. That's what my lesson is about tonight, right? The day you got baptized, you said, this is it. I'm strong. I'm courageous. I'm never going to leave. These are great scriptures. I want you to read with me the scripture I had read at my baptism. <laughs> Not like these baptisms at all, but I needed this read. Matthew chapter 23, verse 15. Oh, dear. Matthew 23, verse 15. I was such a hypocrite, I wanted this right at my baptism. This is a no fun scripture, but I needed it said out loud. Because this is who I was. And I went down into the waters of baptism right before I did, before I got into the horse trough. And yes, it was a horse trough that I was baptized in. Matthew chapter 23. Now, Jesus has some words for the religious, doesn't he? You guys know Matthew 23? There's nothing fun in Matthew 23 anywhere. Jesus is rocking the religious here. He is rebuking people. He's, it's a, like it's smack down for the Pharisees and the religious teachers, right? It's bad news if you're one of them. And that's what I was, so I wanted this right at my baptism. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! What kind of punctuation after that? Anybody? Oh, so it's, woe to you, teachers of the law, you hypocrites. It's not that. Woe to you, you teachers of the law, you hypocrites! This is not good, right? You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. Boy, this is applies to our generation today, the travel generation, right? I want to see the world. And, 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 and I want orphans to be there when I see them. Because then Jesus is Lord. All right. Okay, I don't want to be that old guy. I kind of am that old guy. Stay in one place. But, so, hey man, God bless everybody. Go travel a little bit, see orphans. That's great. <laughs> But make sure you're not this. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much the son of hell as you are. <laughs> Kevin would like one scripture read before he has to read. <laughs> <laughs> before he has to speak. Woe to you. It was a weird baptism. <laughs> and I needed to hear it. You want to know why I wanted this scripture read at my baptism? Because it was that point, after all my years of being a hypocrite, of going to church but not being a disciple, of going to church and sleeping with my girlfriends, of going to church and lying and swearing and having two-faced and backstabbing and this way at church and that way and winning awards, the most Christ-like, I won an award, the most Christ-like man in my high school. It was a religious high school. That's embarrassing, the most Christ-like. Do you know that year? I was the most vile hypocrite that you could ever, ever want to meet. The reason was because I'd gone to church my whole life 
And I was just a convert. I was just a convert for the system. I wasn't a disciple of Jesus Christ. I didn't decide this is who I'm going to be. So CTP, we're checking out the anatomy of spiritual hearts that we have. Here's my challenge for you. Are you a convert? Are you a disciple of Jesus? One way that you can be a convert is I'm just, this is great. Right now, campus ministry, these are my friends. Man, I have virtually no other friends at school. This is a good time in my life. And I just became, I joined their church. What does their church say? Get baptized? Sure, whatever. Okay, that's fine. That's a convert. What are we doing now? Feeding the poor? Okay, let's go. That's a convert. What are we doing now? Sharing our faith? Okay. CTP? What's that? I got to give more money? Oh, okay. That's a convert. These guys traveled over land and sea to make converts. But those converts were still going to hell. In fact, Jesus said, they're going to hell twice as much now than you are, Pharisee. This is scary stuff. Converts follow doctrines. Converts follow the system. Converts are campus ministry fired up, but then when they're not around campus ministry, they're not. That's what converts are. Disciples follow the life and the teaching of Jesus no matter what. You see where I'm going with this? Good, because I'm just about done. But if you don't see where I'm going, I can just keep going. You know me. I can go for another hour. Don't, don't make me do that. Converts attend church. You know, when you walk in this Sunday morning, I want to give you a challenge to stop attending our church. Some of you, you'll be attending for the first time. Okay, I'll give you a pass. But for those of you who are here, stop attending. You kind of mull in like cattle. Oh, we go to the right side. Yeah, that's my seat. That's where I always sit. Stop attending. Move across the rows. Look at people you don't see. Hello, how are you? What's your name? Great to see you. Get engaged. Get there early. Not running in 15 minutes after we're done. Stop attending, right? Some of us are like, I I'm a kingdom kid. This is all I've ever done. Somebody's brought me and I go to my place. Not anymore. You're a disciple. Mm -hmm. Converts are filled with knowledge and information. This, there's some anatomy of our hearts right there. Maybe that explains why Jesus didn't convert people. Really. He loved them. He got really involved in their lives and changed them. You got Zacchaeus, Lazarus, all these, these man born blind. And he's like, hey, do you even want to get well? I, I got to ask you. Do you want to get well? Do you want to be better? Because if you do, game on. We can help here. But if this, is, if this is just fooling around, if this is just another youth group for you, if this is just another fun summer, I'm going to travel the world. Well, I'm going to sit there by the pool. I got other things to do. That's amazing stuff. Yeah. Wow. Now would be a good time to have a really clever ending to my lesson. No, I don't have one. That's my <laughs> so I don't have one. So we talked a little bit about this. What did I say this lesson was? What's well, the one you're going to forget? <laughs> but it's it's the one you, you can forget the lesson and just kind of keep the heart of it. What's the kick in the pants tonight? Really, how committed are you? Mm -hmm. How devoted to Christ are you? Jesus had a resolute heart. You've got to have that same resolute kind of heart in all the areas we talked about. You've got to read your Bible. You've got to pray. You've got to be open, be soft and pliable. You've got to share your faith. You've got to serve others. You've got to give. And when the church meets, you've got to be there as well. There's so much. And there's no magic potion. Just makes a decision. It's just making a decision on a late Friday night. Okay. And by the way, you make these a hundred times. Don't get mad at me. Some of you are right now going, you like to preach these kind of make a decision messages. I really do. They're my favorite things to do. You want to know why? Because I know they're the ones that make people stick. I, I don't know what it is. But it's amazing to me over the years. I talked about the people that aren't here, but now I start talking about the people that are here. My contemporaries, my counterparts, a lot of them, quite frankly, are some of your parents. And I was there those nights 
where some of us were down in the Oise Auditorium sitting on the stairs, the, the walkway that are stairs there, having D groups and in tears and saying to one another, brother, sister, I was there when Herman Cruz, before he was even married, was in my D group and we were in tears saying, I will never leave. And somebody said, but life is going to get tough. Now, if we could bring Herman in here, tell us about some of the tough things that have happened, even before you ever had kids. And then after you had kids, all the tough things. I will never leave, right? Mike Lazine, I could just go, all of your parents. Okay, so you're proving you're old, Kevin. Big deal. No, it's moments like these where you decide. I don't know what my future's going to look like. I don't know if it's going to be fun. I really hope it is. Don't know if I'm going to have kids. Really hope I do. Don't know if I'm going to be happy. Really hope I do. Don't know if I'm going to be successful. Really hope I do. Don't know if I'm going to live in Canada for the rest of my life. Really hope I do. <laughs> We're Americans. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Who knows? But I will not leave Jesus Christ. I will not leave God. Amen? Amen. Raptors. Down by six. Down by six? Six. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, take our lives. Take this next week. For those of us who are walking the CTP, change us. We give you permission.